Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. I'm Colleen Chogan, Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased you could join us for today's talk from Eileen Bjorkman about her new book, The Fly Girls Revolt, the story of the women who kicked open the door to flying combat. Thirty years ago, Jeannie Levitt, then Jeannie Flynn, became the first female combat pilot to serve in the U.S. Air Force. We have a series of photos of her in the National Archives from when she started fighter pilot training in the summer of 1993. In one of the pictures, she's standing proudly with a model of an F-15E Strike Eagle with a big smile on her face. She knew she was making history. With combat experience under her belt, today Jeannie Levitt is a major general in the U.S. Air Force. Eileen's book and the discussion today is about the long struggle for women pilots to reach the point of being recognized as equal partners in the U.S. military. Most of the women who paved the way for General Levitt and the combat pilots of today are not household names, but their grit and determination led to greater opportunities for women and a stronger U.S. military. Eileen Bjorkman is a retired Air Force colonel. She was an Air Force flight test engineer and is now a civilian pilot and the author of The Propeller Under the Bed and Unforgotten in the Gulf of Tonkin. Joining her for today's conversation is Margie Clark Baruska, a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, a C-141 pilot, and a member of the first class of women to attend the U.S. Air Force Academy. Now let's hear from our two accomplished guests. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, well, thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, thank you everybody for attending today. And uh, good, good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. Um, I get at, you heard in my bio that uh, that I'm a retired Air Force Colonel, and I get asked a lot, did you go to the Air Force Academy? And I always say, well, I graduated from high school in 1974, and women couldn't go to the Academy at that time. And they didn't start going until 1976. And a lot of older people will say, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And a lot of younger people say, Really? There was a time when women couldn't go to the Air Force Academy? <laughs> I say, yeah, there was a time when women couldn't fly airplanes. There was a time when women couldn't do a lot in the military. And uh, it was really my generation of women uh, that you know, kind of made that final push uh, to kick open the doors to flying combat. But there's a whole history there from the 1940s you know, up through the 1990s of women who served in, in various capacities. Uh, to um, to show that women belong to the military and that eventually, you know, that they could be in combat as well. So, so there have been a lot of books written about the women, uh, uh, some women aviators who flew in World War II, and there's been a lot of recent books written by women, younger women who've flown in combat, but there really hasn't been a whole lot written about my generation of women, the women who uh, flew in the 70s and 80s, and like I said, made that final push. So, so the book is really focuses on that era, um, but there are a few chapters that talk about some of the earlier uh, times as well. So I'm gonna um, start by, um, oops, get my slides to advance here. So um, I'm gonna start by going very quickly through some of that earlier history and then uh, talking about aviation opening to women in the 70s and then some of the things that happened and the events that, uh, that, that really the final push happened in the 90s uh, before the combat ban was eventually repealed. So, so um, a lot of you uh, may have heard of the women, uh, Air, Women's Air Force Service Pilots. Uh, they were a group of women, uh, civilian women who uh, ferried aircraft around the country. They towed targets. They did various missions to free up male pilots uh, to be able to go over into the combat theater. The, uh, it was led, the, there were two uh, groups, one led by Nancy Harkness Love, one led by Jacqueline Cochran. The two groups merged in August of 1943, so just right at 80 years ago now. And uh, the group actually disbanded before the war ended. Uh, the good news was that there were uh, they, they were not as loot they were not losing as many male pilots uh, overseas as they expected to, which was good news. Uh, but it also meant that the women's services weren't really 
needed anymore or needed as much. And so they actually disbanded before the war ended. And this was very, this was, you know, what all of the women who were serving during the, the war expected to happen. The WASP were never actually in the military during the war. They were a civilian group, but there were thousands of women who were actually serving in all of the military branches during the war. And at the uh, end of the war, they expected to all you know, go home because Congress had passed the law that allowed them to serve just during the war. But there were a lot of um, people that wanted to keep the women in, especially the senior, uh, you know, a lot of the generals that had seen what these women could do. And so they lobbied Congress to allow women to remain in as a small force that could be expanded on if needed again in the future. So a law was passed in 1948 that allowed women to have a permanent presence in the military in the United States for the first time. There had been for a number of years women serving as nurses in the military, but the, this was the first time that women were allowed permanently in the military in roles other than nursing. There were a lot of limitations, though, that were placed on the women. Uh, the, uh, the most, uh, the most Im important or impactful limitation was that women were prohibited from flying aircraft in combat or serving on combat ships. And the actual language said that they could not engage, uh, they could not engage the enemy in combat in an aircraft. So, uh, so that wording, we'll talk about that a little bit later, how that wording is a little bit problematic. So the services themselves uh, did not allow women to fly anyway, even though there was actually no prohibition on, on women flying. The, all the women who had been WASP, no, some of them did join the military after the war, uh, but they were not allowed to fly. They had to take on support roles. By law, the women were limited to 2% of the force. The highest rank they could hold was colonel, and there were a very small number of women that were allowed to be colonels. They were kicked out if they got pregnant or if they had dependent children, even if they married somebody who had children. Uh, they weren't even their own children, and their husbands weren't considered dependents. They did not get benefits for their husbands the way husbands automatically got benefits for their wives. So, um, there, during the 50s and 60s, uh, uh, women also fought to, to serve overseas. There were a lot of changes in the rules off and on. Women other than nurses were not allowed to serve in Korea. Eventually, some women were allowed to serve in Vietnam. Um, but again, it was a fight to you know, just be allowed to go over and you know, be an intel officer, uh, for example. There were some changes in the 60s, though, that started to happen. Uh, in 1967, Congress did lift the grade restrictions and the 2% limit, and that did open the door for women to eventually become general officers. And then in 1969, the uh, Air Force was the first one to open up uh, ROTC training for women. Prior to that point, the only way a woman could get a commission was to pay for college herself go to college, graduate, and then apply to the military to become an officer and go through some kind of a commissioning school. So in 1971, uh, Jane Leslie Hawley uh, became the first woman to be commissioned through ROTC. So 1970 um, is when aviation did start to open to women. Some other things happened in that time period. Uh, women did start to become general officers. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Jean Holm who was very instrumental in the, uh, in, the, in the fight to open up, uh, to get women into Vietnam, to open up additional career fields. And then eventually, even though she had retired, uh, uh, you know, by the, by the time of the final push, she was still advocating for, for women to be able to have roles in combat. There were also some lawsuits filed by women that uh, allowed women to stay in uh, af uh, after becoming pregnant, and also a lawsuit that granted benefits to husbands finally. So an interesting side note is that Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, re partially represented both of those women. She wasn't the only one, but she was one of the lawyers that worked on both of those cases uh, that both went up to the Supreme Court. And then a couple of big things happened in the 70s that started to uh, started to nudge the services to bring more women in. Uh, the first one was that the ERA cleared Congress in uh, 1972, uh, and the services expected that the, e that the ERA was going to be ratified very quickly. It wasn't. <laughs> it never actually was, but it scared them enough to realize that, oh, we maybe should start bringing more women in because once this ERA is ratified and it's part of the Constitution, then we're going to have to to bring more women in. So that started a little bit a little bit of a, I wouldn't say it opened the floodgates, but it started to bring uh, more women into the military. And then the other big thing that happened was the draft ended in February of 1973. 
And so, you know, the draft doesn't just help the army. It also people who say, oh, I might get drafted. So I'm going to go talk to the Air Force or the Navy. Uh, it, it helps the other services as well or help the other services as well. And so all of a sudden you had a lot of folks that were maybe, in, you know, maybe the year earlier they would have considered going into the military. Now they didn't really feel the need to do that. Uh, and so, uh, so recruiters started looking more towards women to try to fill some of that gap. But uh, the Navy was actually the first one to open aviation to women. The, uh, uh, so it was uh, Admiral, um, uh, Admiral Zumwalt. He was very uh, forward thinking, uh, not just about women, but about all sorts of social issues. And so uh, he issued what he called a Z-gram that said, hey, we're gonna uh, try bringing some women into pilot training and see how they do. And so the first class arrived in 1973 and the first uh, naval aviator, first female naval, naval aviator, Barbara Allen Rainey, received her wings on February 22nd, 1974. The Army was not too far behind. Uh, they trained their first woman helicopter pilot, uh, also graduating in 1974. But where's the Air Force? <laughs> it took the Air Force a little bit longer. And the Air Force's position was, women can't be pilots because all of our pilots are combat. You know, they have to be qualified to be able to fly in combat, even though a lot of men were not flying combat aircraft. Uh, but that was the reasoning that they gave for a number of years and, and why they dragged their feet. So, but they did allow women to start flying in other capacities. So in particular, if you remember Jane Leslie Hawley, who was the first woman to graduate from ROTC, she uh, by now was a captain and she applied to go to the Air Force Test Pilot School as a flight test engineer. The test pilot school doesn't train just pilots, they train navigators, flight test engineers, other folks. And so she, oh, she had an engineering degree, she put her application in and was accepted and she uh, wound up graduating in 1975. You see her pictured here with an F-4 out at Edwards Air Force Base. The other big thing that happened uh, in 1975 was that Congress opened the academies to women. Again, the services were against this because they said women are, uh, you know, women uh, can't be in combat. The, the academies train people for combat. And so therefore we should not allow women in. Uh, but there were lots of people who testified that pointed out that, well, in fact, not everybody that graduates from a, a military academy goes into some kind of a combat role. So that's kind of a kind of a red herring. <laughs> and anyway, Congress agreed and uh, they passed a passed a law and uh, President Ford signed it saying, hey, you're going to start admitting women to the Air Force Academy or, or to all of the academies. And uh, that didn't actually happen until 1976. I'll talk about that on the next slide. But in the meantime, the Air Force was at that point still resistant to the idea of women pilots. They said, well, women can apply for the academy, but we're not going to let them go to pilot training. So, but later in 1975, the Air Force did finally agree to um, uh, to send a group of women to pilot training as what they considered an experiment. So, and uh, they accepted 10 women uh, into UPT uh, undergraduate pilot training and sent them to Williams Air Force Base. Uh, like I said, as uh, as an experiment, it's not clear to me exactly what the experiment was supposed to be because they already knew women could fly military aircraft from what happened in World War II. Uh, it seems the experiment was more about, well, how do we actually use these women, you know, given that they are gonna be limited in the aircraft that they can fly, they're not gonna be able to fly tactical aircraft. The Air Force had already decided that they weren't gonna fly. The Navy was allowing a small number of women to fly what's called tactical aircraft. So uh, like an attack aircraft, an A-4 is an example. And uh, the women were not allowed to use them in a combat role, but they were allowed to use them in a training role. But the Air Force had already decided that we're not going to do that. Uh, at best, we're gonna allow them to fly training aircraft like the T-38 that you see in the picture here. This is the first 10 women who went through pilot training. The tall woman in the middle is Connie Engel. And she was a top graduate in her class. And of course she wasn't allowed to fly a fighter. Um, but she was allowed to stay uh, at Williams Air Force Base and be an instructor pilot in the in the T-38 that you see there. So, so now I'd like to um, I'd like to bring uh, Margie uh, into the discussion because Margie was in that first class of women uh, that did go to the Air Force Academy, arriving in the summer of 1976. So, um, Margie, if you could uh, you know talk to us a little bit about 
your experiences uh, at the academy, uh, in particular your, your first year there? Sure, I, I'd be happy to. Um, Eileen, as you mentioned, it wasn't until the fall of 1975 that women were actually uh, allowed into the service academies. So a lot of my male counterparts had been planning for years to go to the academy. Um, it took me just one month to get my application together. And it was very short notice. Uh, but fortunately, I had um, decent grades. I had done a lot of athletics and extracurricular activities. And I was offered a, um, a, a candidacy to go to the Air Force Academy. And I have to say that that um, those first couple months where I was um, getting my application together, I had sent off for uh, um, one of their catalogs about uh, the academy. And of course it was published while men, it was all still men only. And so I read that 65% of all physically qualified men would get to go to the academy. And if they graduated, uh, that 65% was going to go to undergraduate pilot training. So I just assumed, I was very naive. I didn't know what was going on elsewhere in the Air Force. I just assumed that I was gonna be a pilot. And uh, I, I was offered a nomination, as I mentioned, and I entered with the class of uh, 1980, which meant we started in June of 1976. And um, I have to say, I, I was a, a very young, naive 18-year-old when I entered the academy. I, uh, a, a friend of mine uses the word clueless, and, and that's what I was. But um, I was very excited. I was anxious. And on that very first day, it was a, a strange feeling of deja vu because I had been to the academy as a tourist and looked down on the cadets uh, marching and all, but uh, also culture shock. I, I had grown up in Gainesville, Florida, which was a very liberal university town. And uh, the military uh, were not looked on favorably uh, as the Vietnam War was ending. And uh, so I knew virtually nothing about the military. I just knew I wanted to fly. And again, we weren't even allowed to fly at that time, but that was uh, in my vision. But uh, we got off the buses and the upperclassmen started yelling at us and our only responses were, yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. And uh, that, that first day was, was just a blur, lots of running around, marching, uh, getting our hair cut. The women, we had to get our hair cut two inches all around. The men had to have their hair head shaved though. We had to eat at attention. We had to march at attention. It, it was truly a culture shock. But uh, one bright point in all this was my roommate, Kathy Bishop. Uh, she was a military brat and she knew everything, at least in my eyes. She, when I walked into the room, she was already folding her socks and underwear just so and uh, taught me how to do that. She introduced me to the Contrails book, which was a book of knowledge that we had to memorize and answer questions about at any time. And uh, anyway, with, with her there, uh, and, and I should mention her sense of humor too, but um, we got through basic training uh, without too much problem, but um, thank heavens I had her on my side there. But at the end of that first day, after all this running around, we, um, I remember lining up for the oath of office and all of a sudden it hit me that I was joining the Air Force and that I was going to be uh, an officer one day if I made it through. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Thanks so much for talking about that. So and we'll we'll talk more about some of your other experiences here in another slide or two. So, yeah. So, oh, I, oh actually, I did uh, want to ask you one question. Um, when we had talked earlier, you had mentioned about how the women were uh, kept separate in a separate dorm mm -hmm. for the first six months or so, I think. Did you want to just mention yes, talk about that really sure. quick? Yeah. Um, there weren't that many women who uh, were starting. I think it was just over 150, maybe a little bit more. And they were worried that if they divided us up into each squadron, there would be too few women in each squadron. And they wanted us to have, uh, I guess, seven or eight per squadron. So what they did is they only integrated us into half of the, the squadrons. There were 40, and we were integrated into 20 squadrons, which meant that the other 20 were still all male. So there was still a, a very distinct um, difference between the integrated squadrons with males and females and the all male. So there were still some, um, well, there were a lot of rumors about uh, how the all male 
uh, squadrons uh, looked down upon us and did not want to be associated with us. And after six months, we found out that we were going to be integrated, half of us. And I ended up going to an, an all-male squadron with just two of my other classmates. So we were, I, I should say, I was scared to death about going over there. But it turned out it wasn't so bad. Um, our classmates were incredibly supportive. They came over and helped us move all of our, um, our clothes, our equipment to the squadron. They were very welcoming. And uh, I think maybe part of the reason is because we were taking the pressure off of them. Hmm. <laughs> but uh, we we managed, we we made it through, and um, it, but it was uh, almost like starting all over again as a basic cadet, because we had to prove ourselves and get to know the upperclassmen and their personalities, and uh, it was tough. Yeah, and I, and I think that's something, you know, I experienced some of that too in my career, is it seemed like every time I came into a unit, I had to prove myself, you know, again and again and again, so yeah. yeah. So, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, how some of the, within a year or so, uh, some of the cracks started to uh, appear in this combat law, this law that kept women out of combat. So, uh, Lieutenant uh, Kathy Rambo Kosand, who was in the first uh, women, uh, first class of women to graduate from pilot training in uh, 1977, so just a year after she graduated, um, she uh, she went to fly C-141s, it's a cargo aircraft, and she was flying out of McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, and she was uh, flying over in Germany, they were just doing some routine um, operations over there, and uh, some action kicked off in Zaire, uh, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, and her aircraft commander, who was a major, now she was just a second lieutenant still at the time, but the uh, her aircraft commander, who was a major, said, "Hey, you want to go to Zaire?" And he said, "And she said, sure, of course. You know, <laughs> I want to get in the the action here." So, so, you, so you start to see now. Okay, you've got a woman who's going to fly down into a hostile area. She's delivering uh, troops and cargo, and these weren't actually U.S. troops; they were French troops. But she's delivering troops and cargo into a hostile area. Is that engaging the enemy in combat? So, well, most people would probably say, well, no, okay, but now she's in a hostile area. There's a possibility she could be shot at. Um, is that combat? Well, she's not engaging. In fact, she has no way to even shoot back. She's flying an aircraft that is unarmed. And so, um, uh, and, and again, it was this major who made this decision and just said, hey, you're on my crew. You wanna go, let's go. And um, after about a week, uh, some people back in the U.S. realized that there was a woman flying in Africa in the hostile area over there, and they ordered the the, the crew back to the United States. So, but I guess they weren't too upset about it because they decided that the whole crew got an air medal, and she got an air medal as part of that. And uh, this is a, a award that's given for uh, you know for people who do you know who who do exemplary things. Uh, it, it's not always in combat, but it's awarded for uh, exemplary actions uh, you know, in, in an aircraft. So, and um, she was the first woman pilot to be awarded a, an air medal. There had been a couple of flight nurses before her who had gotten air medals, but she was the first military pilot to, to get one. So, um, so now we move into the 1980s and I actually came in in 1980. Uh, I, after I graduated from college, I worked for a year and then decided to join the Air Force because I saw that it was a more, it seemed to be a more welcoming environment. But also in 1981, we had a change in administration. And it did seem like to me anyway, you know, from where I sat as a brand new lieutenant, it seemed to me like the Reagan administration was not that supportive of women. Turned out that wasn't really the case. Uh, the Re Reagan administration wasn't really looking to bring in lots more women and open new roles to them, but they also weren't interested in getting rid of women. However, there were people in the services that saw the opportunity to reduce the number of women because they believed that the Reagan administration would be supportive of that. And so you started to see all these studies about, well, uh, you know, women had proven that they could actually do the job. So then there were studies about, well, they must be impacting, uh, they must be impacting readiness, right? Because they get pregnant, right? I mean, they had, you know, there were all these, they had all these reasons why, you know, they thought that women weren't going to really, you know, be able to do the job in the military. You know, there was concerns about, uh, you know, can, can they really be, uh, you know, Will they hurt cohesion? That was one of the big concerns is that they'll hurt unit cohesion. So, and there was just a lot of concerns in general about 
feminization of the military, you know, worries that bringing women in was going to cause the military to become feminized. And interestingly enough, we're starting to hear some of those same discussions today again. Uh, it's quite frustrating for me to see those discussions still going on after 40 years. So, um, but some things did start to change uh, in 1982. Um, uh, this uh, this aircraft called AWACS, it's an early warning uh, aircraft. You have air uh, controllers, basically weapons controllers on your air traffic controllers, if you will, uh, that are monitoring the skies and, and can uh, use these aircraft to provide early warning of inbound uh, enemy aircraft. And pre previously that aircraft had been closed to women and it did open in 1982. So, um, so now Margie, I'd like to to hand things back to you. So you went to pilot training in 1980. Um, so a couple of years before they opened the AWACS aircraft. If you want to just talk a little bit about pilot training after you graduated from the academy and you know what was what that was like and what what aircraft were available to you and your uh, and the other women. So. Sure. Um, while I was at the academy, the last couple of years there, um, the test program was successful and they allowed women to go to pilot training. And I was qualified physically, so I got to go. Um, I went to Laughlin Air Force Base in Del Rio, Texas, uh, started in August of 1980 and graduated with class 8107 in August of 81. Um, at the time, I knew right away that I couldn't fly fighters, attack, reconnaissance, bombers, a whole slew of aircraft. So I focused on the ones that I could fly. Um, we were allowed to fly transport, uh, tankers, and some specialty aircraft such as medevac or um, a WC-130, I believe, which was uh, weather uh, research related. And we could be trainers. So, but um, after looking at all the missions, I really, really wanted to fly transport aircraft and uh, see the world and fly real-time day-to-day -day missions. And I was very fortunate in that I got my first choice of uh, a C-141 to Charleston Air Force Base. And uh, en route to Charleston, I went to Altus Air Force Base for training. And that's where I met my future husband. And, and as fate would have it, we both ended up in the same squadron in Charleston. Um, we were in Charleston for seven years together, which is actually quite a long time. And I could fly all of the missions uh, that the C-141 flew ex except combat related. combat related. We're getting a little echo there. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, just as just a side note. Yeah, somebody needs to mute, I think, so. I'll try again. No, I think you're good now, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, I was just going to mention that my roommate mm -hmm. um, in pilot training desperately wanted to fly fighters and so and she was at the top of the class and so she was offered a trainer a t-38 which is a fast jet airplane so she was hopeful that if combat aircraft did open to women she would be in the perfect position to go do that and uh, unfortunately this was in 1981 and the restriction wasn't put into effect until 1993 so unfortunately she she missed that window there yeah and that's a story I heard from a lot of women of your era that you know they were they were good enough to fly combat aircraft, but the laws prevented them. And by the time the laws changed, they were they were too old. So exactly, yeah. So so now another thing that happened in the 1980s was uh, is is that the women aviators there started to be enough of you across mm -hmm. all the military services that you could start to kind of organize, if you will. Um, and my understanding is initially it was more kind of a social kind of thing, but also the women from the from World War II, the WASP, uh, they had an organization that I understand reached out to y'all to to kind of bring bring everybody together. Can you talk a little bit about the women, what became the Women Military Aviators? I think it was called something different initially. So. Yes, absolutely. Um, in 1978, the Women Air Force Service Pilots, um, they, they already had their or organization, but a group of them, a small group led by Sarah Hayden, wanted to um, start a new organization that would include the modern women military aviators. And so she incorporated uh, a group called Women Military Pilots Association, or WMPA. And it was a few years later 
after she did this, that uh, three of um, the female instructor pilots at Williams Air Force Base, they were trainers, um, Barb Broom, Karen Daniel, and Julie Tizard um, decided that they wanted to create um, some sort of association for women because there were the, there were so few women um, flying, and I'm talking about pilots and navigators, and we all had um, common interests and problems. For instance, how the uniforms fit or the equipment, how it fit, um, how we related to our peers, our superiors, different promotion opportunities. So they sent out a survey. I think there were about 175 uh, women and pa uh, pilots and navigators at the time to see if there was any interest. And of course there was. And during this time, um, Sarah Hayden from the WASP uh, was put in touch with Barb and they worked together to incorporate the active duty women into WMPA. And in October, 1982, um, 86 women pilots and navigators, active duty, myself included, and 126 WASPs became the charter members of WMPA. And we had our first convention a few months later in 1983. And what was interesting about that convention is there was a female four ship flyby at the Indianapolis 500. It was pretty amazing. And, oh, that's uh, really cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it, it was fantastic. And it, it was really a wonderful start to the creation of WMPA. And um, there was a, a Navy organization that had also started called, I think, the Society for Women in Military Aviation. And we uh, merged with them, or they merged with us. That was headed by Rosemary Mariner. And then a few years later, I believe 1988, we changed our name to Women Military Aviators so that we would include um, pilots and, of course, navigators, but also other aircrew members, because female aircrew members needed um, an organization um, to be part of. And these are all people, women that had earned their wings just in a different capacity. And we also opened it up to all the different services. So today's membership, we have uh, over 500 members and um, we include students. We give them free one-year memberships. We have annual conferences and conventions. Uh, we do mentoring. Uh, we have scholarships, um, quarterly newsletter, and um, myself and Marcy Atwood are uh, the historical committee. And uh, right now our big project is um, interviewing um, our members for our oral history project. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I think it's awesome that you're capturing all these histories. So, cause it's a, it's a big job to do all that interviewing. And I think it's wonderful <laughs> that we're gonna have not just a few stories, we're gonna have hopefully all the stories of all the women who, who went through in this era. So, and like you said, it's not just about pilots and navigators, we've got loadmasters, uh, flight engineers, uh, you know, um, there's all kinds of women that s serve in, in, in many air crew capacities across the, across the military. So um, let's see here, get my screen back here. <laughs> okay, so yeah. So okay, so now 19, the 1983 comes along. So, yeah. Oh boy! And and now we've got some more some more confusion about what women can and can't do, right? And and, uh, uh, and you had some interesting experiences uh, very close together in 1983. If you want to talk about those a little bit, so. sure. Um, folks may remember that um, the Beirut barracks were bombed in uh, I think it was 23rd of October in '83. And I happened to be in Germany at the time and was alerted to go fly down there. Um, I was actually in charge of the um, flight, but um, we decided that because of the hostilities there, actually there were a lot of unknowns, that we should um, fly a combat entry. Well, I wasn't airdrop qualified. I had no idea how to do that. So I turned it over to the other pilots so that he could fly that maneuver in and uh, just keep us all very safe. And then Grenada happened um, just a couple days later. It was called Urgent Fury. I was able to fly three missions going down to Grenada. Um, and it, it was during, uh, it was a combat situation, but um, somehow I still got to go. I know some of my counterparts um, over on the West Coast were not allowed to fly into Grenada, but. I was alerted and I flew, I, I just went. I, I don't know, um, I don't think our uh, higher ups really 
discussed it much. I think I was a warm body and a pilot and I need, they, they needed me. So I went down there. But interestingly, that picture <laughs> of me, um, I was being given the um, accommodation medal for going down to Grenada by Colonel Neal, who was our squadron commander. That's an interesting picture because um, that particular award was given for a specific Grenada um, trip on the 19th of November, and that's when hostilities were over. So what I was, I'm thinking is that they did not recognize the fact that I had been down there during hostilities, but they did recognize the fact that I had been there after it was over. So maybe oh, that's how I was able to get. Yeah, that's interesting. Board. So yeah, because yeah. I remember us talking about how they were like, well, can we really, should she have been down there in the first place? And exactly. but again, this, this starts to show up the problems with this law, though, is that your mm -hmm. commanders, you know, like you said, you don't know exactly what happened, but your commanders were like, hey, she's on the schedule, she's going. And the commanders on the West Coast were like, oh, get the women off the airplanes, and let's bring some guys in to replace them. And so yeah. it's, yeah, so, so you had individual commanders who, who were figuring out how to apply this law um, because there wasn't really a lot of guidance. So, And so, just to mention, I, I was pregnant when I received the oh, award, yeah. but, but not when I went down there because as soon as you uh, were pregnant, you were automatically grounded. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, yeah, was, that was after the, fa after the fact. Yeah, you, after you got pregnant after. So yeah, so the yeah, um, yeah and that's that's changed today. Uh, women can now fly. Um, I mean, they have to work with the flight surgeon and everything, but women can now fly uh, at least for a while when they're pregnant. So yeah. So then some additional things started going on. Um, the uh, in in 1986 we had uh, Operation El Dorado Canyon, uh, which was the raid on Libya. Of course, there weren't women that actually flew in the combat aircraft, but that uh, aircraft was very heavily dependent upon aerial refueling tankers. I think they had pretty much every KC-10 in the world that was flying, uh, you know, was, uh, came over to support that operation. And uh, and there were about a half a dozen women that, that participated in that operation. Again, not going actually downtown and dropping bombs or anything, but again, getting close to the, to the, to the combat uh, area, so. Um, you know, about this time they started to, uh, there was this risk rule that got in, introduced. There were some things that started very gradually. It looks like one weapon system at a time. Some things got open to women like C-130s. Um, but, uh, but again, it was just very slow progress. So, um, and then there was also some potential changes coming along that were going to uh, eliminate women from flying the high performance aircraft that they could. Um, the, air, the Air Force was going mm -hmm. to a dual track pilot training system where uh, they were, uh, not everybody was going to fly the T-38 in pilot training anymore, and so that was going to eliminate women. Only people who were going to go to combat aircraft would fly that aircraft, and so right. that was going to eliminate women from being able to fly that as an instructor. Uh, the Navy was starting to contract out some of those training missions that I mentioned earlier that women were able to fly. And you know, women just, a lot of women aviators started leaving because they started realizing, yeah, my career is very limited here. Um, and, you know, I'm going to go do something else. And a lot of them did go in the reserve. So, um, so the military was still able to use their services, but there, there was really a lot of wasted talent going out the door, you know, uh, in the, in the late 80s. So, and then, uh, and then Desert Storm happened. So it was just, um, you know, I think the door was going to open eventually anything, but this was what I would really consider to be the inciting event, you know, that, that really kind of made that final push uh, possible. Um, Desert Storm was very much, Desert Shield, then Desert Storm was very much a logistics war. You had women flying, you know, all the tankers and the support aircraft taking material over there. Uh, there were women in Saudi Arabia from the first day that aircraft arrived. So we had women helicopter pilots, army helicopter pilots that were there from the first day. And we had women, like I said, bringing, uh, bringing supplies, troops and everything in from the very first day. And the public saw this and it really opened the public's eyes to the fact that uh, that women were already in combat, were already in hostile areas. And uh, by the end of the war, um, you know, they saw that women were were part of the action too. I mean, 13 women died, 21 were wounded and, and two became POWs. Um, here, here's just a couple pictures from there. Uh, this is Major Stephanie Wells, she was a C-5 pilot. Um, here she is with a, a load of bombs that, that she carried over there and then in the cockpit when the, when the war actually kicked off. Um, she's got 
a lot of great stories to tell uh, about flying during that time period. So, and um, Margie, you weren't actually, um, <laughs> let me just do this one slide real quick. So yeah, I, I just remembered. So th this is just showing how far inside Iraq that some of the women actually went as well. So you had army, uh, you had army helicopter pilots, women helicopter pilots who were moving the ground troops forward into Iraq for the final push for the 100 hour a war that took place at the end of February that that eventually led to the cessation of hostilities um, just a few days later. So um, so you had women, like I said, that were very fully engaged in in this war. You know, maybe not going downtown dropping bombs, but they were very much a, a part of the war. So, and Margie, you were um, you <laughs> on point, you didn't actually get to participate though, right? You were at a point in your career where you're doing other stuff. So I I was I had. Um... I had accepted a position at the Air Force Academy to teach. They sent me to get my master's degree. And then I, I owed them four years at the academy teaching academics, but also uh, flying in the T-141 T flying program for the cadets. But it, interestingly, on the um, 6th and 7th of August, 1990, when Desert Shield uh, happened, I was watching it on TV while I was in labor with my second child. So I wasn't going to get to be a part of that, but, um, but I was, I was rooting for him. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, uh, so, but a lot of your peers did, did fly in that war. Yes. And I, yeah. I've got a lot of good stories from all of them. So it'd be great if we could someday get together maybe and talk about all that. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, so um, but the timing was perfect. The, the war ended, uh, like I said, the end of February, which was just about when they started debating the, the defense bill for um, 1990. Two. And so the House almost immediately repealed the combat exclusion law. And then uh, it went to the Senate um, and kind of started to slow down a little bit, unfortunately. And uh, the SASCA voted against the House language. So, and it looked like there were a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people were were kind of startled by the house repealing the law and there were a lot of people that had gone into action trying to, you know, get the, the Senate to not uh, repeal the law. Uh, the service chiefs were very opposed to uh, repealing the law. They testified against it. Uh, you had all kinds of uh, anti-feminist groups that were lobbying Congress, and and so it was things were not looking good for the home team for a while <laughs> there. And then in um, on July 18th, uh, 1991, the Washington Times published an article by a woman reporter who had gone down to Langley Air Force Base and had flown in the backseat of an F-15. And her her take on that was that wow, this is really hard. I don't think women should be able to do this. And uh, and. That really infuriated a lot of women, including Heather Wilson, uh, yeah. who uh, Air Force Academy grad uh, and had gotten out because she couldn't be a combat pilot. And she was later a, a, a congresswoman and secretary of the Air Force. But but she got a hold of the women military aviators and said, hey, activate your old exes. You know, we need to really start putting the pressure on Congress. So and then another woman, Carolyn Beecraft, who was a uh, had formerly been in the army and had to leave the army in the in the seventies because she had gotten pregnant, um, and uh, she was also very heavily involved in this. And she called the WMA folks and said, "You know, get your women and come to Washington." And uh, and so there were a, a number of women that that came uh, from all the services. Uh, they were on leave. They wore their uniforms. They arrived in in Washington on July twenty fourth. And then they went around with uh, Carolyn B. Kraft, Heather Wilson, and I think there were a couple other women who uh, actually did the lobbying because military people can't lobby, uh, and you know, especially if they're in uniform. So their job there was to educate the staffers and the Congress people that they talked to, the, the senators that they talked to, and uh, and then the other four women did the actual lobbying for them. So, and so uh, this is not all of these women were there that day, um, but this is a this is a picture that was taken later. Um, it wasn't taken that day, um, but it is a picture of some of the women who were there, and uh, certainly all of these women uh, played a role in that final push to get things across the finish line with the Senate. So, so the bill finally did pass, um, but there was another bill that was added to that that created a presidential commission uh, to study the assignment of women to combat jobs, because if you don't want to do something, you study the problem, and if you don't like that result, you study it again, and so it was sort of a <laughs> delaying tactic, if you will. And actually, in late 1992, the commission recommended that flying in combat remain closed to women. 
Um, and so at first things were, again, not looking good for the home team. But the day after they made that recommendation, Bill Clinton got elected president. And so with the administration change, it still took a few more months and that's another story, but, but we're running out of time. So, um, but uh, finally in April of 1993, uh, Les Aspen, the Secretary of Defense ordered the services to open combat aircraft to women. And that same day, uh, Merrill McPeak, General Merrill McPeak, who's the chief of staff of the United States Air Force, introduced the first three women fighter pilots to the public. And the first one was of course, Jeannie Flynn. Uh, as was mentioned earlier. So um, so you want to talk just really quick, uh, Margie, about, you know, kind of your your feelings about, you know, kind of how that felt at the end of all that, um, uh, you know, when you heard that, oh, we're finally opening it, so. Yeah. Sure, I I was very excited for the the women who came after me. By that time, I had been in the service for 13 years and it was too late for me to change career paths. In fact, I had just started working with Defense Intelligence Agency and became a, a military attache in Africa flying uh, the C-12, which is a King Air. So I had a, an entire uh, different track to my career, it, it, which didn't and would never involve fighters, bombers, attack aircraft, and so on. But I was very, very happy that um, the women behind me would get to fly. And uh, it was a long road, and I was pleased to be a, a small part of it with uh, women military aviators. And now I'm uh, even more pleased to be able to document the stories of the women who went through all that. That's, yeah, thanks. So yeah, you know, and after we talked about that the other day, I, um, you know, I was thinking about that myself is that I, I've thought about that a few times that if I had been able, when I first came in the Air Force, I couldn't go to pilot training because my eyes weren't good enough. And I thought about trying to go to navigator training but I knew I wouldn't be able to fly a fighter, you know, and I was interested in flying fighters and, and I found a way around that, you know, I went to, yeah. I was an engineer and I went to test pilot school and I was able to fly fighters that way. And, but I do sometimes wonder, you know, if I'd been able to fly fighters, uh, you know, would I have maybe gone to pilot train, I, I'm sorry, to navigator training, you know, and tried to take that route instead. Mm -hmm. So it did impact uh, women's careers. It's, it's nice to have all of those options available yeah. uh, to the younger women now. So, so, um, so this is just some of the women who uh, have have flown in combat or still flying combat aircraft. Uh, like I said, we, we're, we've kind of run out of time here. So I'm gonna see if we've got any questions. And um, uh, if we don't, I'll kind of run through these women here really quick and then we'll wrap up. So no questions. Okay, so um, yeah. So let me just run through, uh, through some of these women really quick. Uh, I think a lot of you have heard of Martha McSally. Uh, she was a, a a uh, retired uh, or a former um, congresswoman and uh, senator, but she was one of those first three women uh, to uh, to go uh, to fly combat aircraft, and she flew the A-10, and she was actually the first woman to uh, fly a combat aircraft on a combat sortie. So, um, uh, so even though Jeannie Flynn was the first fighter pilot, she didn't actually fly into a combat situation until after Martha McSally did. Um, I thought it was interesting. We had a uh, we had a kind of a little uh, reunion uh, at the uh, Oshkosh Air Venture of two weeks ago, uh, where where we brought together the um, the first three women. So it was uh, Martha McSally, Jeannie Flynn, and a woman named uh, uh, Sharon Presler who flew F-16s. And uh, we brought them together kind of as a celebration of 30 years of women in combat. And I learned at that time that that was the first time those three women had been together uh, since they were introduced to the public. <laughs> so they, because they went off to separate weapon systems, they were kind of off on their own and they never, they never really got back together, you know, and, and, and kept track of each other. I mean, they kind of knew who, who each other were, but, uh, but I thought that was interesting that, that they didn't really, um, you know, they didn't really stay in touch that much afterwards. So um, Kim Campbell, you see here, um, she's a retired uh, Colonel, also an A-10 pilot. Um, she was uh, hit over uh, Iraq, uh, over Baghdad, and uh, her aircraft was hit and um, uh, lost all the hydraulics in the aircraft. Uh, very hard to fly the aircraft. It took her an hour <laughs> flying a very difficult to handle aircraft uh, all the way back to, to her base and uh, landed it and uh, received a distinguished flying cross for that. Heather Penny, uh, uh, Air National Guard pilot, a lieutenant on uh, September 11th. Uh, she's got a very interesting story where she um, 
Uh, she took off with her flight lead. They had just come back from an exercise. They were at um, uh, the DC Guard there in uh, Maryland at Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, they had just come back from an exercise, so their aircraft had no weapons on them, uh, a couple of F-16s. And they were they took off to look for Flight 93, which had had crashed by them, but they didn't know that. And uh, But they were planning to ram the aircraft with their jets um, if they had found it to take it down um, because they didn't have any other way to, to take it down. And then uh, Tammy Duckworth, uh, a lot of you are probably uh, familiar with her. Um, she was an Army helicopter pilot shot down in Iraq and um, lost both of her legs. Amy McGrath, a Marine Corps F-18 pilot, uh, recently ran for uh, Senate, uh, didn't, didn't win, but uh, you know, just another example of women who are you know, going on to, or trying to go on to bigger and better things. And then, uh, and then last is uh, uh, Kristen uh, Wolf, uh, Bayo Wolf, uh, her call sign is Bayo. And uh, she's currently the F-35 uh, demonstration pilot. And the thing that I really liked about when she was picked to be the F-35 demonstration pilot is the headlines were not first woman picked to be F-35 demonstration pilot. They were, hey, meet the new F-35 demonstration pilot. And then you look down way down in the article, somebody made the comment, hey, aren't you the first woman to be the, you know, first woman to be the F-35 demonstration pilot? And and so it was, it was not the, it was not the main thing. And it's, I find it great that we are getting past this, uh, you know, this, constant, hey, the first to do this, the first to do that. There's no need to be doing that anymore. Women are part of this, uh, you know, part of part of the military. Uh, they're here to stay and they're doing a great job. So, so I don't know, Margie, if you had anything you wanted to, to add to that. So. I do not. Okay, so let me. So, um, yeah, so again, that's, uh, that's kind of uh, my book in a nutshell. Obviously, there's a lot more uh, stories in there. Uh, you've got some of Margie's stories in there and then uh, other stories out there as well. So, and then, uh, and then this is just my, uh, this is me uh, on my, uh, the, on the F-4, one of the F-4s that I flew at Edwards Air Force Base back in the 1980s. So, um, so my, my, like I said, my way of managing to get into a, a fighter aircraft, even though it wasn't really a fighter airplane, it was a test airplane. So. Eileen, I do see one question, if oh. you'd like to answer that. Uh, the question is uh, asking if the oral histories will become publicly available, and that is our goal. Right now, they are private as we uh, work on their transcriptions, but eventually we do uh, intend to make them public. Okay, great. So, well, thank you, Margie. Thanks for everything that you've done for uh, women military aviators and, and uh, you know, being a uh, being a trailblazer and and helping uh -huh. to get the door kicked open for women, you know, like you said, didn't really help your generation, but it's oh, helped it's helped the subsequent de generations and generations to come. So, yeah. and Eileen, thank you for writing us back into history. <laughs> You're very welcome, and I, I very much enjoyed uh, doing all the interviewing and writing the book. Thanks, everyone. Bye.